You are listening to Make Change Happen, the podcast from IIED. In this episode, Eric Bissell from IIED's Law, Economies and Justice program and his guests discuss the potential of critical minerals in speeding up the fossil fuel phase out and how they can support the productivity and economic growth of countries where they are found. Welcome to this new episode of IID's Make Change Happen podcast. Great to be having a conversation on this topic. Welcome, Emmanuel. Thank you uh, so much, Eric, for having me here. My name is Emmanuel Mpula, and uh, I'm the executive director of African Resource Watch, a Congolese-based human rights organization. We we'll also be hearing later from Keta Kandriana Rafistozon from Publisher to Pay and Rose Mosi and Ben Gassai from IID. They have been kind enough to send us their perspective separately. Critical minerals are in the global spotlight. They are drawing attention because of their huge potential to support the green energy pathway and the push away from fossil fuels. And demand for these minerals is booming. So, in the podcast, we are going to be talking about the many opportunities that critical minerals present for the green transition. But we are also going to be talking about some of the challenges of extracting critical minerals that people perhaps aren't aware of. For example, the impact that extracting critical minerals can have on ecosystem and communities. But before we get that discussion going, I would like to say that the term critical minerals is often used to refer to minerals such as cobalt, lithium, and copper. Minerals which are used for green energy technologies such as electrical vehicles, solar panels, and wind turbines. In fact, the correct term is critical energy transition minerals. As the name suggests, these minerals support the green energy transition. It is important to say that countries are all motivated by the need to phase out from fossil fuel, many responsible of the global warming the world is facing. It was during the Paris Climate Conference that many countries decided to move away from fossil fuels. This determination was subsequently reiterated at various climate conferences after the one in Paris in 2015. With the decision to shift from fossil fuel to green energy, demand for transition minerals has started to boom. Despite the urgency to fight against global warming and the need to phase out from fossil fuels, voices are being raised today about the many dilemmas that accompany the exploitation of transitional minerals and the need for a just energy transition. Dilemmas are many and complex. We are not going to try to address all of them today, but we will have a chance to talk about a few of them. To this end, I would like to introduce the Executive Director of Popular Tupé, Mrs. Keta Kadriana Rafistoso, who will be sharing with us one of the manifestations of this, of this dilemma in her country, Madagascar. In Madagascar, we only have two big mining sites. The first one is located in Mandena in southeastern Madagascar and is operated by QMM, the local subsidy of Rio Tinto. They are extracting ilmenite, a major source of titanium dioxide. Research conducted by the National Coalition of Publisher to Pay showed that local communities experience a consistent loss of livelihood in terms of fish depletion and lack of access to local forests, which were the main sources of revenues for local population. Some of the scientific research accounts for suspicion of water pollution, which may have some effects on people's health. 
Along those lines, grievances related to land loss compensated in an opaque process tainted with power asymmetry generate constant conflicts and divisions among communities. The government is not playing its role, the environmental regulator is not independent, and we do suspect that some local authorities are misappropriating some of the tax and royalties paid by the company, implying some additional losses to communities. It's a really dark picture. The second mine is operated by Ambatvi in eastern Madagascar. They extract and refine nickel and cobalt. A recent investigation by the Malna NGO gave evidence of grievances related to land loss and insecurity among the community. For both cases, it appears that a lack of community consultations, a lack of information, and also the lack of consideration for communities' needs are at the core heart of those issues. A better respect of ESG standards should also be operated urgently. Emmanuel. I don't know about you, but when Ketakanriana was highlighting the environmental and social impact associated with the exploitation of transitional minerals, I was asking myself, if we can say that this is an isolated case, can we say that Madagascar is an, an isolated case? This is uh, certainly not an isolated case. This situation described by um, Kata Riana is particularly the same in my country, DRC, with the exploitation of copper, lithium, uh, cobalt, and other minerals. Mining has always, uh, always had a negative impact on environment, with the destru- destruction of forest, pollution of water, and so on. Unfortunately, today, the exploitation of transition minerals is accompanied by the same negative impact. Another important point to be mentioned here is the fact that the development of critical minerals mining project often comes with displacements of communities, indigenous people, communities, without uh, uh, their free uh, pure uh, free and pure consent and uh, without equitable and uh, appropriate compensation. After listening to you, Emmanuel, we understand that the need to ensure that energy transition is fair for countries where the extraction of critical minerals is taking place. In my opinion, this fairness should not only be about respecting best environmental and social practices during the extraction of the minerals. A just transition should also be one that enables countries reaching critical minerals to capture sufficient added value to generate more incomes and jobs at the local level. This time, I would like to invite us to listen to Mrs. Rose Mossier, senior researcher at IRD, who will address another dilemma that critical minerals rich countries in the global south are facing. The dilemma of critical minerals is seen in the dichotomy between the benefits that critical minerals bring to the energy transition and the risks of mining critical minerals for the producing countries. Now, critical minerals are essential for developing clean energy technologies that are essential for the energy transition. Critical minerals like lithium, cobalt, copper amongst others, are usually mined by a small number of countries, often in the global south. Many of these countries are looking to use the critical mineral boom to improve the economic outlook of their countries. According to the International Energy Agency, the mining of critical minerals is likely to increase due to a demand in due to a rise in demand for clean energy technologies. Now, mining is not devoid of risks. There's governance, social, environmental risks that come with mining. In order for countries to benefit from the critical from critical minerals, 
they need to have a proper plan and governance system in place. Otherwise, these countries will likely fall into what is referred to as a resource curse, meaning they are less likely to see economic growth, they are, le- they are likely to have poor democracy, less likely to see development, and of course have fewer natural resources, as some of it will be, have been taken out in the form of critical minerals. Secondly, mining has negative environmental, social and health impacts. Environmental impacts come due to the invasive mining methods. Social impacts are seen in the livelihoods of the communities that live around the mine or are displaced to make way for the mine. And health impacts are seen in the communities as well due to the exposure to dust, heavy metals, amongst other elements that can cause health challenges. Thirdly, these countries too need to transition and therefore there's a need to have a plan for producing countries to use some of their minerals for the energy transition or for their own energy transition. In DRC, I think what uh, Rose has just described is very uh, a fight we have here in DRC, for instance, where uh, the mining exploitation is not uh, adding value uh, locally. So we are just exporting the raw materials. So this is uh, uh, not uh, giving enough profit for the country where those minerals are mined. So. Um, when we talk about energy transition, uh, we need to think about that. Uh, first, we need to think about the negative impacts on communities, as we described before, but also uh, uh, sharing profit. And sharing profit means we need to have a plan uh, where we see how we add uh, value to those minerals from the country where those minerals are are located to where the consumers are. are. But also we need to create a local market. In Kolwezi, for instance, the world is uh, uh, mineral capital. And when we talk about energy transition, no one will understand what you are talking about. Um, Emmanuel, thank you. Thank you for highlighting the the fact that uh, critical minerals should be considered also as an opportunity for countries, for producing countries. I think it's very important to, to, to clearly say that Critical minerals exploitation do not only come with problems. They are, in fact, also bringing opportunities for producing countries. And um, Emmanuel, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you what GRC is doing, I mean, or is trying to do to capture more added value at, at the country level. I know that there is this MOU uh, with, with Zambia for the creation of a production unit for lithium battery. Can you can you tell more about this production unit for lithium battery? Yes. Uh, after the, the work of coming from civil society asking for how we can add value locally, so Congolese government is trying to sign MOU with other countries like uh, Zambia, US, and uh, um, um, at the end of last year with uh, EU how can uh, uh, them pro- uh, have a unity where they can add a, a value? To add value, this means we need to produce some, not batteries uh, to, to reach the stage of producing batteries, but to, to reach the stage where we can produce a precursor of batteries. Uh, because uh, now the way we are uh, mining those minerals, it means that uh, we are just exporting um, raw materials. So, you know, raw materials do not give uh, enough uh, money for the country and do not contribute to local economy, enough to the local economy. Yes, I think it's it's very important to say that, to, to see also um, critical minerals as an opportunity. And producing countries such as GRC should definitely try to put in place strategies that will allow them to capture more benefit from the exploitation, create more jobs at the local level. And it's really great to see that uh, GRC and Zambia, Angola uh, are trying to correct the myths from the past and try to uh, uh, move forward. We have talked about the, the issues related to exploitation. We have seen that um, critical minerals are also an opportunities for the world in, in his fight against the global warming. Having said that, uh, if you don't mind, Emmanuel, I would like us to talk about a way forward that for various reasons, little 
attention has been paid to it so far. I'm talking here about the secular economy. In fact, the secular economy is a model of production and consumption which helps to reduce the pressure on natural resources by focusing on the rational and sustainable use of product derived from the processing of natural resources. To be clear, I'm not saying that the circular economy is the absolute solution, not at all, but I'm just drawing attention to a model that will allow us to break with some of our, of our consumption habits that are the root of the pressure on nature which induce the global warming. I, I want to make it very clear that circular economy might be a solution as well as critical minerals are can high potential solution to fight against global warming. But as critical minerals exploitation, circular economy also comes with its own challenges, such as the issue of recycling. And on that point, I, I would like to I would like also to hear from Ben Gasside, the head of energy team at IID, on that issue. There's a strong potential for greater recycling of, of some of the minerals we're talking about, but but we need to take a more holistic approach uh, to understanding the overall impacts of the uses, uh, the downstream uses uh, of them from a carbon footprint perspective, as, as well as looking really in more depth at the shared benefits that might be able to be realised as part of a just transition. Let me give you an example taking e-waste, electronic waste, which is still very unre- unregulated across much of sub-Saharan Africa. Batteries, of course, contain cobalt and, and lithium, are, are a central part of, of most electronics. And much e-waste is, is dumped uh, in, in African countries, in, in landfill, or it's melted down in the informal sector to recover the metals and the minerals uh, with, with huge health and environmental dangers. Ghana, for example, has had e-waste dumping from the US and Europe for decades, and there's also now a rapidly growing domestic supply of e-waste. Some of the countries have have made good progress on improving the policies around e-waste. Kenya, for example, has had an e-waste strategy since 2019, and a formal act of parliament came in 2021. Um, But but the same year, there were only six licensed e-waste recyclers, leaving a big backlog for, for those who want to recycle responsibly and quite likely still a huge volume of e-waste dumping and processing within the informal sector. And we shouldn't really vilify the, the, the dynamism of the informal sector and the value added for, for some of the poorest. We looked at some of the, the e-waste value chains in India some years ago. Waste pickers and brokers source uh, uh, waste for both immediate reuse, the, the, the lowest carbon footprint reusing the tablets, the phones, uh, as well as dismantling to source some of the components for refurbishment, uh, which, which, you know, where it's possible can be more lucrative than the, the dirty backyard meltdown, uh, to recover the source materials that, that I mentioned. And and this dynamism and level of inclusivity can be lost by simply privatising waste, issuing large uh, companies licences, um, and policies that that do this are often, as I mentioned, quite quite hard to police across uh, many African countries. So what we really need to do is is better understand some of these nuances, identifying barriers, opportunities of including some of the poorest in these processes of reuse, recycling, and in ways that incentivize responsible behavior along the length of the value chain uh, and by customers uh, as part of building um, more sustainable and inclusive circular economies. So... There is some observation from IID's Ben Gassite on circularity and the recycling of transition minerals. Clearly, there is a lot of potential in more recycling of minerals. But at the same time, more work is needed. Emmanuel, what is your take? In the global south, and especially in TRC, we are behind in putting in place recycling or reuse of batteries measures. So we are behind and uh, we need to, to develop those policies to recycle minerals. That's one. Two, we need to sensitize 
consumers and producers both enough because of the idea of recycling if we need to have a, a, a circular economy. And uh, the third one is, um, of course, those measures uh, will have uh, some negative impact on the country like DRC, where the economy is related to mining. But if for the interest of saving the planet, we should do that. And we need to do. Uh, this need uh, for DRC, for instance, to div diversify its economy, uh, that will allow to to put in place those measures um, in terms of uh, recycling, for instance, and allocated license to company uh, companies uh, which need to to have those license and uh, in DRC. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. We are, we are coming to the end of this podcast. And for each episode of IID's Make Change Happen podcast, we finish with uh, on, on the same question. So what is the one big change you want to see, Emmanuel? In one word or a few words, Emmanuel, what is your big thing? I think one big change is if we can be able to define what just energy transition means for everyone. And uh, Eric, what is your one uh, big thing in terms of change? Thank you, Emmanuel. Before before answering your question, to your question, I really like the fact that um, you, are, you you want the just energy transition to be defined, but you also add one very relevant point: just energy transition for everyone. I think this is where the difference should be done. This is where the accent should be put. Just energy transition for everyone. And I totally agree with you on that. Uh, from, from my side, um, I really want the world to explore a shift from linear to secular economy. Not saying that this should be the absolute solution, but at least we should give it a try. So that is for this episode. Thanks for listening. It has been great to have this conversation around the opportunities presented by Critical Mirrors and also some of the challenges. Thanks to Emmanuel Unpula from AfriWatch for joining me. And thanks again to Keta Kandriana Rafistozon from Publish What You Pay and to Rose Moussi and Ben Gassait from IID. IID will continue to explore different perspectives around Critical Mirrors in the coming month. To find out more, visit our website, iid.org. And you can find out more about today's podcast, our guests and their work at iied.org slash podcast, where you can also listen to more episodes. You can leave us feedback or follow the podcast at soundcloud.com slash the IIED. That's soundcloud.com slash T-H-E-I-I-E-D.